videos I work would know that that's kind of strange casting. I want to get you guys involved. I want to start kind of first, you know, my background, I, I went to business school, had a hedge fund for 10 years. My timing, at least in terms of uh, my parents' birthing schedule was fortunate. I uh, you know, graduated from business school in 97 in the heart of Silicon Valley, which was just outstanding. And I had nothing to do with that timing whatsoever. So I'm kind of a little bit on at least the side of seeing fake it till you make it work. Because I too like all the dorky stuff in the S1s. And I read Amazon's S1. And you know what they say right in there? We are never going to make money, not one damn time. And if we do, it'll be on accident. And once we make that money, we'll probably plow it into some stupid ass initiative. Which people shorted Amazon for about 15 years on. And then they realized, oh, this company is doing $250 billion a year. It's probably worth something. Point being, the optimists tend to kind of take a lot of the lion's share of the money when we've been working a con since basically we've made up a case against Britain and decided to declare independence. So we're running on 240 some years of this. Basic idea that we can sort of pay it forward or at least stick it forward in terms of the debt. So my question becomes, how do we trade this? How do we make money? How do we, how do we pay the rent? How do we live off the now because when i look at the economy i stick strictly now with consumer stocks consumer domestic stocks why because they're able to grow for the first time for reasons that we'll talk about in about an hour organically domestically for now and there's a long short component to it that's hedged yeah, well, but i, I can would, pay the uh, bills with it the I, the I, it's not a battle of styles but the question is how do we eat well, today Peter? You, you're setting yourself up for for a big loss by doing that because you know the, the US consumer is literally on borrowed time right I mean consumers are not spending out of income they're spending out of debt uh, they're buying stuff they can't afford uh, they're levering up in order to do it it's only a question of time when once the dollar drops then prices go up and interest rates go up the consumer is finished so a lot of these stocks in the US I mean we have a tremendous amount of retail capacity in the United States but these uh, retail outlets are really just distributing all these imported products that we're not going to be able to afford to buy. So you're going to see a complete implosion in the retail sector. I mean, you know, it, it, so I mean, a lot of these companies are going to go bankrupt. It's not just the the dot coms that have been this, this, you know hurting a, a lot of these brick and mortar retailers. But what you really want to do is recognize if you want to talk about how to trade this, recognize what is the Fed going to do. So rather than fighting the Fed, what is the Fed going to do? to try to prevent everything from imploding. Well, they're going to do what they've been doing, right? They're going to keep uh, printing as much money as possible. They're going to keep rates as low as they can for as long as they can. And, and, and that has the tendency to prop up some stocks. But I think the stocks that will do the best under those environment are the ones that are multinational. In fact, if you look at how the Russell 2000 has been performing, it's the weakest of the indexes. You know, the, 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 the domestically focused stocks are much weaker than the global stocks because the U.S. economy is extremely weak. But if you realize that the Fed has to basically sacrifice the dollar, that's all they can do. And of course, in the end, that's the worst thing they can do. But because we're, we're going to end up suffering much more because they, they, they delayed it as long as they did. But you need to buy all the things that are going to go up as the dollar goes down, which is why I said emerging markets are going to be great and gold. I mean, gold stocks and emerging market stocks, if you want to hedge this, if you want to make a lot of money, that's where you're going to do it. Okay. Against the idea of me setting myself up for a huge loss, which was entirely conceivable, I would counter that Americans are going to spend $9 billion on Halloween shit over the next 30 days. <laughs> Bumblebee costumes for dogs, candy that we don't need because we're all fat anyway, we're going to go out and celebrate because Americans like to spend. And they're going to do that. This is going to be probably the 15th, 16th consecutive years of Halloween growing. You can't <clears> kill it with a stick. That's we gonna, love to buy crap. Hey, not I'm not saying it, go up. It, it, it certainly is helpful for the Sox. Party City goes bankrupt. Target takes over the share. Can I just we, have, we have this, this self-fulfilling. Go ahead. This plays into a much larger ideological debate, right? Either you believe the system as it exists today is ultimately what is going to bring us to utopia and the promised land and that it will continue to exist the way that it does today, under which case, yes, buying you know, Target at a 20 PE instead of a 30 PE for very good reasons, Jeff knows retail extraordinarily well, then yes, that might be the right thing to do 
in this case, as long as that underlying foundation of bullshit holds up, right? So what you guys are having is you're having an ideological argument, kind of your stance in the system as it exists today, and Peter's contention that the foundation, the bedrock, is at risk. And it's an interesting ideological debate because nobody really knows the timing. Obviously, I believe inevitably the, the bedrock will show cracks in it, right? See, but you United can't trade inevitable. I got to eat today. Yeah, what the United States, we basically put the cart before the horse. We're trying to grow the economy based on spending money. You know, hear that all the time. The consumer is the engine of the economy. No, you can't grow the economy based on consumption. You have to grow. I mean, you have to grow the economy, and then you can consume. First, you have to save and produce, and once you've done that, then you can consume what you've produced. But we're trying to do it backwards. We're trying to go right to the consumption and skip the savings of the production, and 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 basically get all that stuff from the rest of the world. And we get the rest of the world sending us all the stuff that we didn't make. And now we just build this phony economy based on spending all this borrowed money. But that is, you can't continue that. Because in order to keep it going, we have to make the bubble bigger and bigger and bigger. You have to keep on putting in more and more credit. Got to go deeper and deeper into debt. But, you know, just like any drug, I mean, if you are determined to never stop taking drugs and you're taking this heroin, but as you take heroin, you build up a tolerance. And now in order to get high, you need more heroin. And then you need more and more. At some point, you, you overdose. At some point, you're going to die if you keep increasing the quantity of the drugs that you're taking because you don't want to stop taking them because when you stop, you go through massive withdrawal. And the bigger the habit is, the longer you're taking it, the worse the withdrawal. And that's where we are as an economy. We've been injecting all this monetary heroin in the economy for so long that we're afraid to stop because that's how bad it's going to be when we let this whole house of cards that we've been building up for decades come tumbling down. But we're not the only ones that notice that. Again, I get to I get to the catalyst because I got bad news, we're all gonna die. I hope that's not a spoiler for any of you, but we're all gonna die at some point. I have to eat in the meantime. So again, it comes down to what's our catalyst gonna be because it's the argument for confidence in the system. I, I was on the Today Show the day after they announced TARP, which was surreal. And because I had no idea. And I knew it was bullshit. I didn't just chug a bunch of stupid juice downstairs. It's not like I, I thought, oh, God, these guys came up with tarp. This is going to fix everything. So Meredith Vieira looks at me and she says, Jeff, what does this mean for Americans? <laughs> Beats the shit out of me, Meredith. <laughs> I mean, literally, there's a camera in your face. There's this woman who's insanely intense who wants an answer that's going to basically mollify America. And I'm looking at the puppies that are playing together because the next segment was about puppies for, for vets or something. <laughs> and they're, they, you know, they show the, the mandatory <laughs> little clip about a guy who's getting his house repossessed and Meredith <laughs> kicks it to me for, you know, what does it mean? It, is he going to be saved? I have no idea. It made for really bad television. My point being, I understand that it's rigged, but that didn't break us. We've got a guy in the White House right now who just might be leaning towards a little bit batshit. That's not breaking us yet either. You know, what, we, at what point do we get this catalyst? Because the bubble can continue for quite a yeah. long time. You, however you regard it, a you, bubble or a rally, you still yeah. are setting up a terminal point that doesn't is well. I look. You know, people were saying the same thing in the 1990s about the dot coms. And that bubble came to an end. People were saying the same thing in the aughts about the housing market. Oh, Peter, this could go on for a long time. I was renting property uh, for years and years. Uh, I remember when I first moved to Connecticut. I moved to Connecticut in 2005, and I was renting a house. And people were telling me at the time, you know, this, you know, this is so foolish. You're throwing, you know, the houses were going up. You know, in the housing market peaked in Fairfield County, Connecticut, where I live, in 2000 and five or six, you can buy a house in Connecticut today for maybe 20 or 30% less than it was 20 years ago. In fact, it, and I was renting for years and people were like, oh, you're throwing away money on rent. The house <coughs> I ultimately bought, which of course, I bought it because I didn't care. I had more money than I knew what to do with, so I, I was willing to buy a house. But the house that I bought, I was renting it before I bought it. It was on the market for, I think, six and three quarter million. The guy who sold it to me, paid four, four and three quarter million in 2002, and then he put money into it. I ended up buying it for 2.2 million, 
at the end of 2009, had I done nothing to that house, it'd be worth 1.2 today, 1.5. I mean, I didn't even come close to catching the bottom, but at least I was like, look, I don't care. I've been renting for years. I couldn't build a house for this money. I, don't, I didn't feel like moving. And so I bought it and I ended up you know, putting money into it. But you, I mean, you, I've been watching the market there. I mean, there's houses that were you know, six, seven million that are two. You know, there's one house on the market that in 1996 sold new for um, two and a half million. And it's on the market for 1.2 and it still can't sell. And you look at it, you know, it's been on the market for three or four years and they keep cutting prices. But the house looks brand new. They redid the roof, they redid the kitchens, they redid the bathrooms. But at, at the point when I first got to Connecticut, people were so optimistic on real estate. They were like, it can never go down. You're a fool for renting. You're throwing your money away. Right. I was like, I'm not throwing my money away. I'm saving money by not overpaying for a house. But the thing is, you never know this bubble, right? is the biggest bubble yet. And because it's the biggest bubble yet, it's gone on longer. Uh, but because it's so much bigger, when it pops, it's going to be so much worse. And I know it, there's another bubble too, which I guess we should talk about because it's part of this panel, which is Bitcoin and, and crypto. Because that's just another example where you have that, that mentality, that bubble mentality, uh, where you know people just pile into something because it's because it's been going because up. it's the seat of an argument, an alternative to a system that is perceived widely as broken. I mean, it, it's <laughs> they book it. You can do, talk to us about Bitcoin. Bitcoin, tell us, tell us, tell us. The, First off, I'd like to say my house cost one hundred and seventy-two thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> So you should probably listen to Peter before you listen to me. Although you know my house in Puerto Rico has doubled since I bought it five years ago. So, but to the point on housing, where real estate's going up. Yeah, I wait, lived wait, in wait, Westchester wait. as well up until 2009. Those houses are all gone because they took away all the banking jobs. And so when you sell three million dollar houses and you put 30 of them on the market at the same time, all of a sudden you got a bunch of one million dollar houses. Yeah. I don't disagree with that, and yet the sky didn't fall. That was that was you know we well, sold it them did fall. the same time. 2008 was if the Federal Reserve had not stepped up in 2008 it would have been so much worse now that would have been the right thing to do but remember before 2008 you know when I was going on you know CNBC when they still had me on and I was going on Fox News and I was saying this stuff and people were laughing it was like there's no way this guy could be right nobody could see this coming this was like you know you're a weatherman and there's this category 5 hurricane just right off the coast and you're looking and you're saying everything is fine it's a nice great nothing to worry about they could not see the severity of this crisis, even though it was around the corner. Well, the next crisis is worse. It's even more obvious, but it's the same group of people who were completely blindsided before who think there's nothing to worry about. So what's the terminus? Because you're talking about a decade ago. A lot of the scenarios that you, you discuss happened dead on. We're not disagreeing on the price of housing. We're not disagreeing on a lot of this. But the market's four times higher. Yes, the market the market and, went and up. And CNBC won't have you on anymore. Yeah, the market went up. <laughs> That's just your congratulations like, for getting yeah, it right. The market went up just like it went up in the, the 1990s. Yeah, the Fed inflated a big bubble. But the inflation of that bubble deprived the real economy of the assets it needed to restructure and actually grow wealth. All we've done is grown debt. We've just gone out on a consumption binge. It's a bigger consumption binge than the one we had in the 2000s. That's when, when, when you had all the economic cheerleaders on CNBC. I used to go on Kudlow's show a lot, and it was the greatest story never told, the Goldilocks economy. He thought it was great because he's a very partisan guy. I like Kudlow, but he's very partisan. And if the Republicans are in charge, then everything must be great, right? And as long as you're cutting taxes, everything must be great. And I was going on that show saying, look, this is a bubble. We're just borrowing. We're consuming. This thing's going to pop. Real estate's going to go down. Stocks are going to go down. And you know the Republicans are going to have to pay for this because it's all going to get blamed on capitalism and the Republicans. And we're just you know sowing the seeds for the Democrats to take over in, in 2008. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah. And but now you have the same thing. You have the same phony economy that we we had under Bush, we had under Obama, and now Trump. But it's only bigger. The Fed is doing. Everything it did back then to inflate the bubble, only it's doing more of it to inflate an even bigger bubble. And then you have to ask yourself the question, when this bubble pops, is there a bigger bubble that the Fed can inflate to, to, you know, to kick the can down the road again? I say absolutely not. I, I, also think, have no, to ask I didn't think it though. could happen last time, but it did. Yeah, which brings us, if you hang out long enough, you got a story to go with everything, just like Trump has a tweet for everything. My first short on CNBC ever was telling Larry Kudlow that GM was a short. That was 2000. 
I might be the only person in history that didn't make money shorting GM in 2000. It just kept going. Cash for clunkers. And then we had 9-11. We were going to give those away for free. The goddamn company went bankrupt. They yeah. jammed everybody nine ways from Sunday. It took seven years. It, it's, again, where do you put your money tonight? These folks got to eat. I got to eat. You, how are you trading this current environment? Because, again, you need a catalyst. A trade needs two things. It needs a good idea. You've got a hell of a thesis, and it needs a catalyst. What what tips us? What yeah. breaks us? Because we've got a guy well, who's I mean, bad shit who's declaring a trade I mean, war on got, Europe. Look, you got two things. You can try to trade the markets, you know, day trade, and try to figure out what's going to happen over the span of time. And that, you know, that you've got to use technical analysis. You can do whatever you want to do. I'm not interested in that. What I'm interested in is the big score. What I want to do is find a narrative where everybody is betting one way, where I know they're wrong, and just bet the other way. That's what I did with subprime. But that's what, you know, when you look at what's going on, if, if the vast majority of people believe something that you know is not true, you know, you can make a lot of money when they figure it out. Now, the problem is it could take a lot longer than you think before, but it, it's always going to happen. Yeah. And so I just want to have my money on something that I know long run is going to pay off. And that's also one of the reasons I even moved to Puerto Rico, because I think I'll make so much money on this. And I don't know where the capital gains taxes are going to be. I mean, they could be 70, 80, 90 percent. Who the hell knows? So apart from putting my money where I know there's going to be huge capital gains, I wanted to live where I know I think government couldn't tax them away. You have money, though. What, what, what are you doing now? <coughs> All right. So, not to, awesome. not to so far, this has been the easiest you're, panel you're, I've ever been on. I yeah, just sit here and you're nod a my head. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Fucking this guy's right. Exactly. <laughs> Jesus. I feel like a potted plant up here. All right. Anyways, first and foremost, just to address your Bitcoin question from before that you asked me, Bitcoin's an interesting kind of struggle also ideologically because it seeks to solve a very real problem, right, which is the problem of central banking. So while the motives may have been altruistic from the get-go, which, by the way, gold fixes that problem, right? I mean, gold is the answer to that problem, which is why Peter is so, you know, pro-gold and anti-Bitcoin. But also Bitcoin is nothing. You know, it's computer code. And like he says, you know, it's something that people buy because they expect the price to go up. They're not buying it because it's a safe haven. They're not buying it because it's a store of value. They're buying it because they're speculating. Because they expect to turn around and hopefully for me to be able to sell this guy my Bitcoin at higher prices. So if the power grid goes down in a real catastrophe, how do you access your Bitcoin? Yeah. You don't. And that's yeah. it. That's the only thing you need yeah, to know. Right now. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah. I'm not done yet. All right. Sorry. <laughs> I love you. Hey, you're my favorite right. economist. You gotta let me talk for one second. You can't reach out and hold your Bitcoin like you can reach out and actually like own gold tangibly and physically, right? So the, the Bitcoin debate is, is I think, a, I think it's addressing the correct problem in the wrong fashion. I forgot what your second question was, but one of what the- What the hell do I do with my Bitcoin? Well, How do I the, make my rent? One I, of the I, other things I just wanted to bring up to append to what Peter said, and then I'll let you go, is I don't think that, uh, another thing that I don't think the market is pricing in is the potential outcome for a democratic president in 2020. Now, regardless of whether or not you think it's going to happen, whether or not you think it's possible, when you think of the central bank shit show, right, starting from the beginning, and you build this foundation up of one kind of patch after another, after another, one quick fix after another, after another, after another, we get to this point now that Peter talks about where we're arguably creating a bigger bubble than we've ever had before. On the very, very tip of that, there is this other kind of like risk that exists within the system if you buy into the system that we have now which is the potential of a democratic president and you think about how much the market has rallied over the last three years based i mean we well, saw the tax all, all cut. the rally was in the first year the market hasn't gone anywhere since the beginning that's true the we, saw, we saw the deregulation the and the tax cut narrative propel the market higher, even when nothing was getting oh, yeah. done. It's like the trade deal narrative now. You know, Trump, you know, makes a phone call to President Xi's, uh, you know, car dealer, and all of a sudden that's looked at as a positive, yeah. you know, the market rallies a thousand points on that. Meanwhile, President yeah. Xi probably can't stand the sight of him, you know, and so the same thing happened with tax cuts and deregulation. And I think there's a huge kind of existential risk there, even within the system yeah, that's not being we have The there. deregulation story is vastly overblown. Uh, the tax cuts, again, were a gimmick because government spending went up 
And yeah, the market hasn't even begun to price in the, not only the probability, but or the, the, the Democrats are most likely going to win. I, I, I can't see uh, how Trump is going to get reelected, uh, you know, given the economic reality. And really? Pe people look at the polls, too, and they say, well, the polls got it wrong. Look, the polls had it right as far as the popular vote. Trump lost the popular vote. Where the polls didn't capture was kind of the stealth Trump support that I talked about, where people were discouraged with the status quo. They knew they were getting lied to, but they were kind of embarrassed to admit that they were voting for Trump. But they were there, and there were enough of those people so that Trump could narrowly win a few key swing states to put him over the top in the Electoral College. So is but, that my trade? Because again, no. I'm not a frantic day trader. No. I actually make a real live living, and I've done that for 10 years that, that we're talking about in terms of a correction. So I yeah, need a Yeah, but the point I'm making is that Trump is getting killed in the polls in every one of those states that he barely won. Uh, and so, yeah, the market's going to go down as the market begins to price in um, the, the, um, the, the loss of Trump loss. In fact, the fourth quarter of last year, right, was the worst first quarter, fourth quarter since the Great Depression. And, but the Fed was able to save the day by aborting the rate hikes, which, which I said they would do. But now, the first two days of this quarter were the worst of any, any quarter of, since 2008. So the market's probably going to go down on that. And, you know, you can, you, there's plenty of things you could short. But I want to get back to Bitcoin and, and just talk about it because Bitcoin is really nothing more than modern day fool's gold. I mean, it is a counterfeit of gold. When, when Bitcoin was conceived, it was marketed as, as gold, right? If you look at the way they depict Bitcoin, it's a gold coin with a B on it. But there's no substance to Bitcoin. There's nothing there. It's not a coin. It's not any color. Um, the way Bitcoins come into existence, they say, is you mine them. The people who you know, create them are called miners. But there's no mining going on. All they're doing is solving complicated math problems. They're not mining anything. And it takes a lot of energy to solve those math problems. But at the end of the day, all you've created is a string of numbers that cannot actually do anything. But what happened with Bitcoin... But isn't that the argument against gold, where you dig I'm, it up and it's industrialized? No, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you. So anyway... Yeah, Jeff. Now... <laughs> what the hell so, do you want? <laughs> Jesus, Jeff. Now, a lot of people got frustrated about real gold because, you know, gold peaked out at 1900, as I said. And, you know, when Bitcoin really started around 2010, 2011, you know, gold was kind of peaking and it wasn't going anywhere. And Bitcoin, all of a sudden, it was pennies and then it was $1,000. And then all of a sudden, it got the attention of CNBC and people like that because it had gone way up, right? And when, and when they really hyped it up, you know, when they piped it up to 20,000, I used to start calling CNBC uh, crypto news Bitcoin because that's all they did. They hyped the shit out of it, you know, until, you know, they, they, they conned their viewers into buying it and they bid it up to 20,000. But when, and I've, I've debated all these guys, every Bitcoin guy that's on CNBC every day, they tout these guys out, they let them, they don't challenge them, they let them hype it up. And, you know, their audience is, is in for a, a big loss when this, when this air comes out of this bubble. But, what the Bitcoin guys don't get and what, what they say is they say, look, gold doesn't have any value, right? So Bitcoin doesn't have to have any value. They say that, look, the dollar has no value. The euro has no value. So why can't Bitcoin? Why can't we just have our own where there's a limited supply so they can't print as money? And what they don't get is the difference uh, between when you have a, a Federal Reserve note that has no intrinsic value, right? It did when it was backed by gold, but right now it doesn't. What gives it value is the fact that it's legal tender, the governments demand that you pay taxes in that currency. So every one of us uh, needs to accumulate dollars because we have to pay our taxes in dollars. There's a demand for it. And you have a long tradition of prices, there's bonds, uh, there's you know insurance products. You, you, there's a way to relate you know dollars you know with some. Now in the long run, the dollar you know all fiat currencies implode, but sometimes it takes a long time, and then sometimes it happens very quickly. But you can't just start. You just can't take something and say this is money, right? That has no value. That has no use in commerce. Um, gold. What what gives gold value is not just the fact that it's scarce but the fact that it is the most useful metal in the world. I mean, gold is used not only in, in, in jewelry, which is the, the biggest use. I mean, here, I'm, I'm wearing 24 karat gold cufflinks. When I bought these cufflinks, there was about $2,500 worth of gold in each one. Now there's $3,000 worth of gold in each one, right? Because the price has gone up. But I can, I can take this gold and you know, it can, I can use it, right? It's, 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 but it's still it's, priced in dollars. 
No, it doesn't. The, it, the, do, it, it, the dollar is actually priced in gold. The dollar is priced in gold. So, because right. gold is real money, everything else is substitute. But not only I, everybody in this room that has a cell phone has gold because there's gold in every cell phone. There's gold in consumer electronics. There's gold in aerospace. There's gold in dentistry. There's always real demand for gold at any price because gold is is such a good metal as far as it's the best conductor and it does all sorts of things that make it very key where it's used. That if the price of gold is three thousand or five thousand, that real world demand for gold is always going to be there. Right. Right. There's real use for it. And the reason gold became money was because it was a highly valuable commodity. Money was an invention that that was an improvement over barter. When people were bartering, you would exchange one good for another good. What money was, where you had you found one commodity that you could accept in exchange for all commodities. So if I paid somebody gold for something, I got something of value, and they got something of value, they got gold, right? If they didn't want to use it themselves, they could trade it to somebody else. Bitcoin copied a lot of the properties that made gold better money than you know cattle or salt or wampum or you know all sorts of things that have been money all different commodities have been money we've been but off the gold standard for 50 years though no but the, i know but that's I'm, I'm talking about why gold is different than bitcoin so gold has real value right and, and because it had value it was able to be money bitcoin is starting from the point where it has no value there's absolutely nothing you can do with a bitcoin except give it to somebody else Right? And the only thing that gives it market value is the confidence that somebody else is going to want it, even though it has no real value and no real use. And there are people that try to say, well, you know, it has use, you know, just like software, because it's, you know, it, but that's an intangible. I mean, software has value because I can use it to make me more productive. It can do something, right? Or if it's entertainment, right? If it's music, I can listen to it. I can dance to it. I can sing to it. You know, it's, it, it, it satisfies a desire. Bitcoin is intangible, but it does nothing. It satisfies nothing, and it's all a function of do people believe in it? Now, the problem is now, you know, the bubble popped. Bitcoin went to 20,000, then it went down to 3,000, then it rallied back up to 14,000, and people got excited again. Now it's back at 8,000. 20,000 was most likely the peak. That last rally to 14,000 was probably a little bit of an echo bubble, and now we just cracked. We're probably going to move down to you know, 6,000 to 4,000 again pretty soon. Uh, the whole thing is imploding. You've got all these big whales that own all kinds of Bitcoin that want out. I mean, it's, you know, that the only way you make money on Bitcoin is to sell. You've got to find somebody who's willing uh, to cash you out. But yeah, we haven't been on a gold standard for 40, 50 years. That's why the economy is so screwed up. That's why we have all these malinvestments. That's why we have all these imbalances. That's why we have all these bubbles. It's because we've, we, we've taken real money out of capitalism. And that's why capitalism is, isn't working now and why it's got such a bad name. And in fact, capitalism is going to be under attack like never before in 2021 when we have, you know, socialists uh, running the country. Because up until recently, most Democrats were socialists. They just didn't want to admit it. Now they're willing to admit it. It's like a badge of honor that you're a socialist. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, but I think the world is going to go back on a gold standard. I mean, because that's when? the only standard that works. When? I don't know the exact date. When the but, shit hits the fan. That, why, that's is, one. why is China I, buying which, all which, I'm not let me, let me just say something real quick. Shit's shit's kind of got all this this let me add on to what you're saying real quick. You know, when it comes to a matter of timing, so you say, well, we've been off the gold standard for 40, 50 years, right? That goes back to another ideological argument. Not really. Wait, it goes wait. back to 10 years ago, that's 12% of our lives, give or take. That, that's well, a pretty decent chunk. Yeah, that's 20% of our You didn't, even, you didn't even let me finish my well, thought. Well, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Please hold, do. You hold on. You're telling me you're wrong. You didn't even hear what I was just, had to say yet. The point I'm trying to make is it goes back to an ideological argument of whether or not, you know, departing from the gold standard, whether or not we are going to be able to replace thousands of years of gold being an economic instrument from what we've been doing here over the last 40, 50 years. And to, and to speak to his point of timing and what you were saying about timing earlier, you know, that is really the big variable, the big question mark that there is, right? The, the question is, how long is it going to be, like you asked, when are we going to go back on the gold standard, right? When is the shit going to hit the fan? Mm -hmm. Now, I don't like to get specific about when I think that's going to happen because I don't really know. And, but the one thing that I'm certain of is that it will happen eventually. But because kind of the journey we're on here is an unprecedented experiment into monetary, but we've never done anything like this before, right? So this has never been policy in our country ever before. Right. So we don't know 
whether it's going to be five years, a decade, two decades, five decades, or 200 years. I was jokingly say on my podcast, you know, the, the Fed is looking at next week's plan where they should be looking at a 100-year plan or a 200-year plan. And I don't mean issuing 100-year bonds. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the point of the matter is that it, it is this unknown that lurks out there. And in terms of timing, that's the one thing we can't kind well, of like... You, you got to put the last 50 years in perspective that in the scheme of things, it's not a lot of time. And it's not like we invented right. paper money. Paper right. money was here before the Republic. And in fact, the reason the founding fathers uh, put us on a gold standard, constitutionally, the only thing that can be money in the United States is gold and silver. Right. And the reason the founding fathers wrote that into the Constitution was because they had experienced firsthand the collapse of the Continental which was paper money that lost 90% of its value, and it gave way to the expression not worth a continental. But the founding fathers had studied history, and they knew uh, European history was replete of examples where countries had printed money, France and you know, other countries, where they, they, they ended in, in hyperinflation and collapse. And so they put us on a gold standard, and we stayed on a gold standard uh, you know, pretty much in some form until 1971. I mean, we, uh, Roosevelt diluted it somewhat, uh, but there were still, we, we still had gold as money. And, and the world was still on a gold standard because the, the, it was on the dollar standard that was backed by money. So this, this is not the norm. Having a, a fiat currency, not money backed by nothing, is not the norm. It's the exception. But right. every time it's happened, it's always failed. The only difference now is it's happening all over the world. The last central bank to officially break with gold was Switzerland, where they, 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 they got rid of their, their requirement. But, and that was like in the 80s. But we have the whole world now that has made this mistake because they followed the, the, the lead of the United States. But just like every other experiment in paper money that has been conducted, it will fail. Just like every experiment in socialism. You have all these socialists that want to reinvent. They think, oh, they just did it wrong. Right. You know, Stalin, he didn't do it right. Or, you know, Mussolini didn't do it right. I and mean, yeah. we just need the right people. You know, Castro didn't do it right. I mean, you know, look, it doesn't work. No matter how many times they, they try it. Well, it's the same thing with fiat money. Money has to have value. You know, you, it just can't be something you create out of thin air. So it's going to crash, but this time the whole world is involved. It's not just one individual country that went down this route. It's the entire world. And from a cognitive dissonance perspective, that can, you know, that can make things last a little bit longer. The fact that everybody has this confirmation bias between countries. You know, if Draghi's telling Powell that he's doing the right thing and Powell's telling Draghi he's doing the right thing, well, it turns into a big circle jerk. But, and the you fact know, and everybody, that, yeah. But the fact that they're, you know how you know you're near the end of the rope? We've got negative interest rates. I mean, these guys have been lowering rates, lowering rates, lowering rates for so long, and they, it hasn't dawned on them that the problem is that rates are too low. Right. That is the problem. But their solution is always to lower rates more. It's like medieval doctors bleeding people. Oh, let's take some blood. Oh, they got sicker. Let's take out more blood. That's all, that's all they can do. But now we're at negative. That tells you that, I mean, the, 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 what's, you know, I mentioned how you have these... Uh, Money losing stocks that are now coming down, finally. Well, what's even more irrational than a money losing stock is a negative yielding bond. Because at least with a money losing stock, you could have the belief that it may one day make a profit, that one day they're going to turn around and their stock going to generate profits. When you buy a negative yielding bond, it is impossible to make money. If you hold that bond to maturity, you are guaranteed to lose, right. yet people are buying these bonds. On so, that much we agree. So that, negative that yield bonds have a end, negative yield. Yes. end of the rope. Take your word for it. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, if you go back to the beginning of this decade, this century, 2000, gold has outperformed the U.S. stock market, right? So, I mean, take a little bit longer perspective. Since 2000, gold has been the U.S. stock market. Now. Is gold beating the, some of the biggest stocks of the bubble, like Netflix? No. I mean, if you put all your money in Netflix, you beat gold. But how many people did that? Now, I have plenty of stocks that I own personally that are up 10, 20 fold uh, over the last 10, 20 years. I own those stocks. Now, do every stock that I buy go up 20 times? No, because I have a diversified portfolio. You know, I, some of them went way up. Some stocks I bought went down, you know. But 
this is obviously you're talking about a bubble in those names, right? These are the stocks that benefited the most. Uh, but these are the stocks that are ultimately going to crash. I mean, these stocks are all going to lose, you know, probably 90 percent of their value. You know, I don't know that they're going to go out of business. But I remember during the the dot com bubble and I you know, wasn't as you know, famous back then. I wasn't on television, but I was out there in 1998, 1999. And when the Dow, the Nasdaq was at 5000, I predicted 500, you know, and I said, look, this thing is going to crash by 90 percent. The only reason I was wrong. The only reason the Nasdaq only fell to 1100 was because Greenspan cut rates to 1%. I didn't see that coming. But once he did that, I, I basically got bullish on the stock market because I saw the mistakes that, that Greenspan was making that prevented the Nasdaq from going where I thought. But a lot of the, the big companies, a lot of these, you know, the Pets.com and the Globes and the Dr. Coops and all this crap, you know, I was predicting back then in 1998, 1999, that all these stocks were going to go to zero and they went to zero. But during that time, I was missing out. I had a lot of, you know, I, had, I was a small broker and I had clients and my clients were not making any money because I wasn't buying any internet stocks. I wasn't buying any tech stocks. But when that market imploded, the stocks that I had been buying, I was buying oil in Kazakhstan and Russia. I had stocks that went up 50 times. I had the stock Hurricane Hydrocarbons that I bought. I started buying it for $5 and it went down to 25 cents and I kept buying it. And then it went to $55 and got bought out by, uh, by China Petroleum. 55. They never did a reverse split, right? And a lot of these stocks that they were giving away during the 1990s, the old economy stocks, gold stocks I was buying, foreign other stocks I was buying in New Zealand and, and, and Hong Kong that nobody wanted, I wasn't making any money on them. I finally made money on them in 2002 and three and four and five. And so, yes, there are people that have money in these bubble stocks. Let's see if they get out. Right. The, it, you know, we're, we're in Vegas. A lot of people gamble in Vegas. It's one thing to be ahead. And, you know, you can go sit down at a poker table and you can get a nice big stack of chips. Right. But if you leave the table and you're broke, that stack doesn't do you any good. Right. I want to have all the chips when everybody else is busted. Right. So that's what I think I'm positioned for. I think those stocks, I mean, if you were lucky enough or smart enough to be in them, fine. But you've got to sell. You can't just, you can't stay late to the party. Stocks are not a suicide pact. You're allowed to sell at any time. In fact, it's free. I've been at a note which says <laughs> we're tremendously good looking, man. More questions. You, sir. Yeah, so the interest rates around the world, you know, that's coming to the United Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, the, the banking system is, is, is completely insolvent, right? I mean, the government created that because of the moral hazard implicit in government guaranteed bank accounts, right? Before the government guaranteed bank accounts, and that started in the 1930s. But before they did that, uh, consumers did a lot of research before they put their money in a bank because they wanted to make sure that the bank was solvent. And the banks competed with one another based on who had the best loan portfolio, who had the safest bank. Well, once the government came in and created the moral hazard, nobody gives a damn what the bank does with their money. And the banks know this. So they take all kinds of crazy risks because the taxpayer is guaranteed everything. So the whole system is insolvent. Yeah. And so if you have your money in, in a bank, one of two things are going to happen. The bank is going to fail eventually and you're going to lose your deposits. Or the bank is going to fail and the government's going to print money to make sure that you don't lose your deposits, but your deposit is going to lose its value. So either you don't get your money back or you get money that doesn't have any value. So what sell banks should, and gold. What, what you should be doing is, look, you can own real businesses like I do. I invest my money and I own businesses around the world in countries that I think are going to uh, end up in better shape when this whole thing collapses and the dollar is no longer the epicenter. And, and, and you, you know, you the world is not subsidizing the American consumer and, sub and, un and financing the U.S. government. I think there are countries that are going to prosper. I want to own real assets, real businesses, 
property, uh, infrastructure. Give me an industry in a country and I got to keep taking questions. Well, I, I mean, I'm in Singapore and Switzerland and Hong Kong and New Zealand and Australia. I'm in Norway and, you know, Sweden and, uh, I mean, you know, countries. Favorite can, country right now. Just. I don't know. I'm also in not? China. China. I, mean, I don't know that I have any one. I mean, there no, nobody is perfect. Everybody makes mistakes nowadays, you know. But it's just a, the sure question not. of degree. And also in you know, Southeast Asia, in South America, you got Chile, you got Peru. Chile, Peru, one of the less mistake-prone countries. You, sir. Well, it's really more of a depression, uh, and it's an inflationary. It's going to last for a long time. You know, the, the, the Great Depression, the reason it lasted as long as it did is because, you know, the Fed inflated a bubble. This is nothing new, right? The Fed inflated a bubble in the 1920s. They kept interest rates too low. They inflated the stock bubble, real estate bubble. The bubble popped in 1929. And Hoover, instead of just doing nothing, right, like he should have done and just letting the market function, we would have had a severe recession like the one we had in 1920. It would have been over within a year, maybe 18 months, and that would have been the end of it. But Hoover decided to intervene, you know, and he did his own version of TARP and bailouts. And because he did that, he prolonged that recession long enough to elect Roosevelt, who actually campaigned criticizing all the interventionists and the deficit spending of Hoover but then as soon as Roosevelt came in, he took Hoover's policies and expanded them. And so because of the government intervention, that recession lasted until the end of the Second World War. And by the way, a lot of people think that the Depression ended when the war started. No, it ended when the war ended. In fact, the worst time economically in the United States was during the war. But nobody complained because we were at war. But stuff was rationed. There were shortages. It was very difficult. Fun uh, trivia fact. From so, 1922 until 1989, Sears had one down year, 1932. So they but, did okay. but, but my point is, this recession is going to be with be us this, for a long, long time. And, and you know, and, 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 <laughs> two more and, questions. And, and especially because the, 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 we're, we're going to go all in, right? That's what the, the left wants to do. They want to well, take, start moderating. They wanna take the New Deal no, fine. programs of, of Roosevelt <laughs> and they want to complete the process. Hey, all right, it's somebody an somebody asked me a question. Ask a question, you, sir. <laughs> Somebody's got to have a question for me. Just about sports, anything, you know. Ask Chris a question. Where Beers that I like to drink, go? something that I'm an expert in. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, how am I, look, if I could put a date on it, I mean, I, I, how would I, how can I be that smart? What? Well, I think, look. A year from now, where's gold? Well, gold's going to be higher, right? Okay. So, I mean, how much higher? It's hard to say. Look, I think the stock market peaked, right, in January of 2018. I think we've been in a stealth bear market ever since. We did make some marginal new highs in some of the indexes, but the average stock, nowhere near new highs. So, you know, we had that big euphoric run up that started with the election of Trump and went on for that first year. So I think, you know, even if I go back over the last 12 months, uh, my portfolios have substantially outperformed the S&P. That's the first time that's happened in many years that we're actually beating U.S. stocks by investing internationally. And that's even with the dollar strengthening. Uh, but once the dollar starts to weaken, uh, the gains are going to accelerate outside the United States relative to here. So I don't, you, know, you don't know exactly when it's going to happen. But I see the trends has turned. I mean, gold is broken out now, right? Gold, gold right. is up 50% <laughs> since, You're since in, 2015 Chris. low. All right, look, here's something that's like super important to understand. Because it's a super fair question, right? And it's like probably the question you get the most. And it's definitely a question that I get a lot which is if you don't understand the timing, what's the point of trying to make the analysis, right? And I just, I don't want to try and tell you when I think it's going to happen. And I don't want to try and make, you know, and if you listen to my podcast or you look at my Twitter or whatever, one of the things I don't do is I, I don't pin down timelines for a couple reasons. The first is, as I said before, what we're doing now is an unprecedented journey. So we don't know. So I don't really think there's a historical reference to look back on to say, oh, this is going to be a 100-year problem, a 200-year problem, a 50-year problem, or it's, or it's going to end tomorrow. I don't think we have anything to look back on to be able to say that. But what I do think is important 
And, and the other thing, too, I'll concede to Jeff and what I've said before, and which is really the truth, is I do I have a portfolio of stocks also that will do well if the system as it exists today holds up throughout the course of my lifetime and doesn't implode before I die or before I have access to my capital again. And I think an important distinction that I think is lost when people from the Austrian school of things start to make predictions with timelines, a distinction that, that's lost is that we don't know. And, and I think you make a very good point. People that tell you that they know when it's going to happen and why it's going to happen, what the catalyst is going to be <clears throat> and when the catalyst is going to occur, they don't because it's never happened before. We've never been where we are now. And one of the realities of TV as punditry in general is that everyone's time frame is different. We all have different life expectations. We know we're all going to end up dead. The idea of holding stocks forever is flawed in the fact that someday you need the money because maybe you want to retire and live. You had your hand up. We have time for you and then one more question. There's also a lot of people in the financial world that are held up as geniuses that aren't. And oh I think that's as important to remember as yeah. what you're saying. You know, just because somebody's cranked out of an Ivy League institution with a PhD in economics doesn't mean that Ben Bernanke's not going to stand in front of the United States in 2008 and tell him that the subprime crisis is contained when it isn't. It doesn't mean that the Securities and Exchange Commission isn't going to miss Bernard Madoff when it happens and there's a whistleblower yeah. that testifies in front of the government. The future's right. uncertain, but the well, end well, is the, always near. The, I hear you, and you're right. I, the problem is the guy who wrote that, by I the way, has been dead for 40 though. years. The problem is... You can't mitigate it. It is all the attempts to mitigate it that have made the problem so much worse. We have to swallow the medicine. That is the problem. The only way to solve the problem, right, is to take the medicine. And that means assets have to be repriced. Stocks have to come down. Real estate has to come down. People have to lose money. Businesses have to fail. Consumers have to stop spending. They have to start saving. We have to start producing. Government programs have to end. People have to be told the truth that they're not going to get Social Security. They're not going to get Medicare. A lot of this stuff has to happen, but nobody wants it to happen. I was a psych major. People are, love to <laughs> mitigate. They love it. Okay, last question. Fire it out. So I've never seen uh, Chris before, but I actually... Uh, He's got nice caps. I remember his podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I remember his podcast. I really recommend it to everyone. Yeah, it's me too. Um, Thank you. Good night, everybody. <laughs> 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 You can trade. Buy, buy every dip in gold. You'll make money. I mean, gold's going up. I mean, it's a... No, now. It's going up now. It's up... It's at 1,500. It, it's up, you know, where was it at the beginning of the year? 1,200. My best trades this year have been shorting pullbacks. All right. We're good. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on one second. One second. One second. Button us rallies. up. We need a button. I've got what, one ready. One you second. go. Yeah, but you the point, the, 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 the point the that trend is up. The point that he's trying to make is that over the course of the very long term, you have to zoom out a little bit and stop thinking about you know who's going to make money over the next two years, five years, ten years, whatever, and and understand the principle of gold being priced in dollars, or as we were saying before, dollars being priced in gold, which is really what's happening, 
right? And the purchasing power of the dollar continuing to decrease and what the price of gold is going to do in the interim. And in Peter's, as Peter said on my podcast, it's not necessarily going to give you a premium on the price of gold, but it'll preserve the wealth that you have today. I, look, I think you make a very, very good point in your question, which again, comes down to timeline, right? Well, yeah. if, I'm, if I'm 40 now and I live to be 80 and I'm riding up the roller coaster on the best bubble in history, does anybody give a shit what happens 150 years after I die as to whether or not the whole system collapses? Probably not. Like I'll be super stoked to buy property today and sell it for 10x what I bought it today 40 years from now, right? So I think it's important to understand that distinction. And one of the one of the things that I like to make clear when I talk about this is that this is a long-term problem that has been occurring for decades now since we've come off the gold standard. And it's going to be probably a yeah. longer time before we see this. But the, the important thing that people need to realize is we don't know because we've never done it before. So I'm, what I'm not telling you is go out and sell 100% of your equities and go into gold completely. That's what a I'm beautiful button. Just, but just in, be but in the meantime, in the we meantime got you. gold... Got you. Gold yields more than almost all the sovereign debt in the world with less risk. <laughs> he likes gold. He says old time Zero stocks yield is better have a than mix. Negative. In the course of human events, people have to take a potty break and then come back and talk about retail stocks. I want to thank our two guests. We'll be back in two and five minutes. Jeff, thank you so much. <laughs>